Hi, I'm Femi OK. Welcome to the stream. At a time when India is grappling with the coronavirus pandemic, also the economic fallout from lockdowns, many are wondering why in Jammu and Kashmir, a union territory, there is a new law that is creating a lot of controversy. That new law is the domicile law, and we will be talking about that today. Now, if you ask Kashmiris, they will have very strong opinions on this law. If you are already in our YouTube chat, we would love to hear from you and you too can be in this conversation in the stream. I will introduce you to the guests. They will introduce themselves to you. Mirza Sayib, it's great to have you here on the stream. Tell our audience who you are. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mirza Sayib Meg. I'm a Kashmiri lawyer. Great to have you. Mona, welcome to the stream. Please tell everybody who you are. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mona Bhan. I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology at Syracuse University. Welcome to our conversation. And Safwat, introduce yourself to our international audience. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Safwat Zargar. I'm a journalist based in Srinagar. It's the main city of Indian and Mr. Kashmir. This conversation has generated so much online conversation and I'm going to go straight to YouTube here, Safwan, and, and put this point that Marine uh, has here. She says, uh, doctors, we have no masks, PPEs, hospital beds, adequate staff and ventilators to deal with COVID-19. Reaction here, take this new domicile law for J and K, Jammu and Kashmir. Safwat, when this law became law, what was the reaction? Actually, there was no reaction. Basically, the idea was to uh, introduce this law at a time when there was this pandemic and there was a lockdown in the valley, which is very severe with compared to the other Indian states. So the actually the idea was to negate any kind of possibility of any pro protest uh, to this decision. And if we see the way the Indian government has been going ahead with the, all the exercise and all these decisions and all those laws, uh, the, they have not actually uh, sort of paused for some time so that this period should be there, there should be a debate or discussion with the people. It is just a unilateral mm -hmm. decision making which has been happening since August 5. And uh, actually, uh, the, uh, Kashmiris feel that the idea was to introduce this law in a, at a particular point of time so that it, there, are, there is no reaction. At the same time, Kashmiris also know that the, uh, there, there are a seri series of decisions which are going to come uh, in the coming weeks or maybe months so that the entire project and uh, this settler coalition project, uh, which actually Kashmiris think uh, this decision actually is of, so is, is put in place. And uh, uh, that is uh, the ground situation, particularly here, uh, this time. Just looking at some headlines here from Outlook, amid coronavirus lockdown, government comes up with a domicile law for Jammu and Kashmir. One more headline here, I want to share this with you. This is the reasoning behind it, coming from New Delhi. The new JK domicile rules will give equality and dignity to all. Uh, Mirza Sayyib, can you explain very simply what is in this law? What difference will it make? if you live in JNK, actually, if you live outside of JNK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, these rules create a new class of citizens who will be eligible for domicile certificates, uh, which has now been made mandatory for admissions in schools and for employment opportunities in Jammu and Kashmir. So they've created a few classes, such as people of in Indian citizens who have resided in Jammu and Kashmir for a period of 15 years, they will become eligible. People who have studied in Jammu and Kashmir for seven years, they are eligible. And people whose parents have served the Indian government in Jammu and Kashmir for 10 years, they are eligible. So the biggest fear in Kashmir right now is that this is going to cause a demographic change. But what I want to point out over here is that the demographic change is not going to take place. It has already taken place. What is happening right now is just a de jure legitimization of what is already de facto. So the 2011 census, and bear in mind that this is nine years have already passed since this census. Uh, according to that, there are between 1.5 to 1.7 million non-Kashmiri migrant laborers who have lived in Kashmir already for 15 years. Now, that is roughly 15% of the total population of Jammu and Kashmir. They will now get to vote in Kashmir's local elections. And so, uh, and so the new domiciles will acquire incredible political power. Uh, and they will be el eligible for domiciles uh, in Kashmir. So these rules are a fast track procedure. Yes. 
I, I, I'm just going to go straight to YouTube. It's so busy right now. Selavi, thank you for being in this conversation. Selavi says there is no controversy. Uh, this aggressive scheme is planned to change the demographics of the Muslim majority country of, and I'm going to use the words that, that Selavi use, occupied J and K. Mona, pick up on that. Uh, right. I, I, I think there is uh, no controversy. I think it's um, as clear as it uh, as it gets. Uh, we have to understand that what's happening with uh, recent changes in domicile law, as, as uh, Mirza and Safa uh, just explained, it's part of a long term uh, strategy right, of the RSS, uh, which is the, the parent unit, the motherboard, uh, if you will, of the BJP, the ruling party uh, uh, of which Modi uh, is the uh, is the leader. Um, so this is an ongoing uh, uh, ideological crusade, right, of the RSS to redefine Kashmir as uh, a Hindu territory. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind uh, is exactly that, right? So that is a larger rationale. That's a larger logic that shapes everything else, uh, the technicalities, the modalities, the legalities of what India is trying to do in Kashmir right now. Having said that, uh, I do want to make a thing, uh, one thing very clear for our international audiences who might not necessarily know this. There is, of course, been this image of uh, India as a democracy. For Kashmiris, of course, this India was never a democracy. It was always an occupying power uh, right from 47 when the instrument of accession, a very controversial instrument of accession was signed, of course, by the Hindu Maharaja of the state. Uh, for a predominantly Muslim majority whose voices were not taken in the, into account even back in the day, right? So this is an ongoing onslaught uh, on, on a Kashmiri sense of being and identity. Uh, what, what's been happening since August 5th, I would argue, is of course, as a lot of people have argued, the beginning of the darkest phase uh, in Kashmir's history, but also uh, a continuation, right, of institutions and policies of enslaving Kashmiris uh, under the Hindu majoritarian uh, rule. Mona, can I ask you this question? It comes from Waris, and Waris is on uh, Twitter. Uh, uh, Waris wonders out aloud, how does such an undemocratic legislation come into effect in the world's largest democracy? The Indian identity should be questioned every time it calls itself democratic. Mona, that is what you were saying. How is this possible? <clears throat> Uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. Sayyid, can you weigh in here because yeah. you are the legal scholar? Sure. How how is yeah. that possible? Well, first of all, uh, picking off from uh, Mona, uh, you see the domicile rules right now. They are being administered by an unelected administration uh, because we have had no elected government for nearly two years now. But it's important to point out that even if this was done by elected officials in Kashmir it would still not be truly democratic because of the nature of elections in Kashmir. You see, we do not have a truly independent election commission. So elections conducted will not be free and fair because any representation of the popular political will is criminalized. As a result of this, most Kashmiris boycott elections. So either way, it would not have been a democratic exercise. But if it were done by an elected government, it might have still retained some fig leaf of democracy, at least on paper. And in the case of Kashmir, Indian democracy has always been procedural in nature. It's not a democracy in practice because in name there are elections, in name there are people who get who represent people, but the popular sentiment of the people never gets representation. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. these elections are just proceed. The democracy is just procedural in nature. Yeah. Let me just bring in, Ms. Uh, if, if, I, if I may, I'm just going to bring in some more comments and then I come right back to you, Mona. I want to bring in Ms. Bereshi here, uh, and she's very critical of this domicile law. This is what she told us a little bit earlier. The recently released domicile law creates a new category of non kashmiri domiciles. The first question to be asked is why this domicile law, given its irreversible consequences, as it is deeply rooted in a demographic change, is being passed Firstly, during the time where all institutions of this state should be battling the ongoing health crisis. Not that the absence of the pandemic would make things better, but it is a comment on how keen the government is to stifle any form of protest or dissent against this law. Mona, go ahead. Right. So, no, I, I mean, absolutely. Uh, the fact that it's happening... Um, in, you know, in conditions of a militarized, it's a militarized lockdown for Kashmiris. It's a, uh, it, something to be uh, said also to uh, to uh, 
perhaps flesh this out for uh, audiences who might not be aware and who might think of this COVID-19 lockdown in Kashmir as, much, as, as something that's very similar to what's happening in um, other places, we have to recognize that Kashmiris have been experiencing prolonged militarized lockdowns for the last 30, 40 years now. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's happening now is, uh, I, I just think of it as one lockdown superimposed over another, pretty much how the virus works in this case. Um, so we have to, we have to understand uh, uh, the, the lockdown, the COVID-19 lockdown in Kashmir is not a public uh, health, mm -hmm. not not passed in the in in the interest of uh, securing public health. N not that it was done so in the Indian context either, but in the Kashmir context, the mm -hmm. the, the the situation is even worsened because uh, the idea is not to maintain health; it is to essentially penalize people, to punish them, to render them homeless. Uh, and that's Simone, exactly I, what I, 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 I know yeah. that, and I, just so that our international audience will, will hear this, the, right. the, the ruling party, BJP, will push back on that, saying it was only a medical necessity for those lockdowns. But you have to remember in the context of uh, KNJ, or J and K, uh, there had already been security lockdown. So it was lockdown on lockdown. Let me just bring you back in, Safwa, because I, I really want to hear what's happening down on the ground, because you are right there in Srinagar. Medical Booster says here on YouTube, the domicile law would give every citizen of Kashmir equal rights. That is a very different perspective. Safwa, what are you seeing in terms of how is this law working right now? I mean, it's certainly driving the anxiety. Basically, people are afraid that they will be overwhelmed by the uh, inflow of uh, non-JNK citizens who will be sort of em empowered to be uh, citizens of Muslim majority Juman Kashmir. And they actually know that uh, the idea is to invisibilize uh, Mus Kashmiri Muslims, and uh, which will actually uh, essentially change the nature of the Kashmiri uh, dispute, which is a recognized dispute before the United Nations. So the fear is real, and uh, they are experiencing this at a time when they have been sort of they have been coming from a prolonged shutdown since august and now this another lockdown so kashmir has been shut literally for more than a year now around a year a year now and there is no internet and there is a curb on uh, civil liberties you cannot hold a protest i mean the st people are still locked up and uh, when uh, this is sort of seen in the context of what is happening with the muslims in india i mean all of that is getting registered here and people are actually preparing for something which they haven't seen uh, because it is going to be an onslaught uh, not for, from the military only but from the people i mean who are being sort of incentivized to uh, be part of uh, and uh, be the residents of this disputed territory i have to say guess as we were getting ready for this program we wanted to hear obviously views from kashmiris incredibly critical for this program we also wanted to know who on earth would be thinking to move into these union territories what was the mindset this is how we actually asked the question and that question then became news have a look here on my twitter feed here are you in india and planning to move to jammu and kashmir under the recently introduced domicile laws what is behind your decision send your thoughts for, for this actual conversation we wanted to know who would do that who would move ifra says to me people don't just plan to move there but it is a plan to move people there, which is what you've been telling me. And then of course, then Al Jazeera is making headlines for actually even asking who would possibly want to move into an area that's still a conflict area, that they still have 2G internet, if you're lucky. Mr. Sayyib, can you explain who would be there? Who would go there? Who would plan that? Yes, well, before, before I get to that, I think um, in light of this tweet that you just pointed out, I must say, that uh, there's a certain casualness of language because of which the the pushback has been the critical uh, comments we have received such critical comments mm -hmm. from Kashmiris because of this casualness of language yes, uh, yes uh, uh, because see, you see the domicile law notification is not a benign exercise for tourism what Kashmiris mm -hmm. are living through is not normal it's not merely accidental it's a consciously engineered onslaught on our right to life with equality and dignity and it is forcibly engineering a demographic change that strips Kashmiris of the rights that we have earned for ourselves after decades of struggle against feudalism. 
So uh, when this, when the language is phrased in a very casual way, which makes this exercise seem benign, uh, it is definitely going to offend uh, Kashmiris. So that's why the, so, the the criticism, that's the criticism that they receive. Right? Now, in uh, response to your question as to- Miss I can I, I'm just gonna get at, at Akut, come back here, come back here to my laptop because we acknowledge that on the stream and thank you very much for you, for you, our audience, helping us with, in terms of, this is how you actually frame the conversation. The language is very important. 186 responses to that, we hear you. Thank you for helping us make sure that we get the story right. Mona, what did you want to say? Go ahead. These are some uh, and and to, add to, to, to add to a couple of things, to add to Mirza's point, I actually think it's not even benign language, right, Mirza? It's, it's language that's dressed up in humanitarianism, right? It's, it's meant to ensure equity and, and, uh, and rights to people who, uh, for example, were deprived of those uh, rights to land or rights to property or rights to education. So, for example, when India makes this claim, it is to uh, foreground, you know, the rights of West Pakistani refugees, uh, most of them from lower socioeconomic classes and lower caste who migrated from the Sialkot region of Pakistan into Kashmir in 1947. Now that uh, when you know when India dresses up its settler col colonial uh, in intentions in this humanitarian garb, that is to Mirza's point, right? It obfuscates the agendas even more, especially yeah. for an audience that does not recognize uh, the the sole intent, that, that, that recognize that the sole intent of the BJP is to uh, change the character of the only Muslim majority state uh, and a disputed yeah. and occupied state in this region. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I completely agree with you. You know, uh, they, there can be no both sides to such a story because when the weight of evidence points incontrovertibly in one direction, both sides cannot be treated with equal value. I mean, impartial journalism is commendable, but uh, in situations like this where a false yeah. balance seems but, to be struck, it, it's quite dangerous. Mirza, me, me, I, I don't personally think there's any such thing as impartial journalism, but you must try and get as many perspectives as possible for the audience to to make their decision as well. Um, thank you for helping us with that. I, I'm, I'm gonna show our audience something here. This is a story that we ran with last November. There was anger over Indian's diplomat calling for the Israel model in Kashmir. And what he was doing was he was uh, in the United States and he was talking about uh, Jammu and Kashmir and how you get Kashmiri Hindus to get to go to that union territory and the language he was using was the language that the, the many people who are Kashmiris are worried about that somehow people are going to come in from outside of the region and change the culture the nature of the region and they called it a settler mentality and here we have this Indian diplomat absolutely saying that out loud this comment went viral let's have a look because we already have a model in the world we, I don't know why we don't follow it. It has happened in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the, if the Israeli people can do it, we yeah. can also do yeah. it. Yeah. I think we should just in Jammu and Kashmir will improve, it will allow refugees to go back and in your lifetime you will be able to go back. So it would be remiss of me if I didn't say following that controversy, Sandik Chakravorty said, I have seen some social media comments on my recent remarks. My remarks are being taken out of context. But Safwat, let's, let's give some more context here. The reason why the domicile law is so problematic for Kashmiris, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the impact on jobs, on uh, the environment, on what are happening to uh, Kashmiris who were already struggling. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, that's. A, I mean, it's a basically. Uh, I mean, a simple observation there because uh, Kashmir has has no private sector corporate sector, and the and the government is the, actually the biggest employer. So, in terms of employment, there is an issue there. But at the same time, when you are uh, sort of giving citizenship to uh, unbridled citizenship to people who can who have stayed here for some period of time, then you are actually 
cutting the proportion of jobs for local kashmiris and which basically are disempowering economically and secondly when we talk about land settlement of land kashmir has only 30% of i mean land inhabitable where people can stay and there is already land crunch so is this will necessarily actually necessarily go to into the i mean uh, economic uh, ecological destruction and there will be a huge impact on the environment and kashmiris actually feel that and at the same time uh, you have to look at the land and amount of land occupied by indian paramilitary forces in kashmir i mean it is uh, there are like 6 lakh canals of land under their control and uh, we have seen uh, uh, recently that in north kashmir's uh, baramulla district we have seen army issuing notices to the government uh, saying that like we want to purchase this land i mean this has happened for the first time uh, in the history that army is actually saying that they want to own this land otherwise they have just a temporary arrangement there and i think the it is going to set up a chain of reaction in a sense that if because it is being if it sold somewhere uh, a mm-hmm. person sells it somewhere then it's going to become become a pattern and eventually that land is going to become much like how israeli defense forces own land in palestinian uh, occupied territories i want to bring right. in amit uh, amit rainer here uh, and i just want you mono if if you would just bounce off the back of him because there's a very different feeling when you're outside of jammu and kashmir as to when you're in the rest of india so amit here is in New Delhi this is what he told us let's have a listen we as an organization always demanded the abrogation of article 317 35a because we believed that it was discriminatory against rest of india we believed that people of india have equal right on the state of jammu and kashmir on the jobs that are being offered in jammu and kashmir on the land uh, in jammu and kashmir we as an organization have always demanded one law one constitution one nation What would you say in response, Mona? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, it, it's it's sort of ironic, right? That because uh, if you look at the, the the history of Article 370 and when and how it was instituted, uh, it was a movement started by Kashmiri Pandits, uh, the the uh, the numeric minority uh, in Kashmir, uh, and at the time, the slogan that was used by Kashmiri Pandits was "Kashmir for Kashmir." Um, and uh down with outsiders and so on and so forth and and you know the sort of evolution of that slogan to kashmir only for kashmiris uh or to you know kashmiris for outsiders now uh we have to understand the evolution of that uh of that movement within the context of uh what pundits of course recognize as an exodus uh or a departure right from the valley in 1989 uh i have to uh, i mean this is such a complex topic but i do want to make a <clears throat> make a quick sort of uh intervention here to help kashmiri pandits also recognize their own history in initiating these uh these laws when it benefited them uh over time what's of course happened is because muslims are in a majority in the state and rightfully uh you know the jobs and uh you know land holdings etc should rightfully belong to the majority uh, that's not that, that did not sit well with uh, the minority community that was uh, deeply privileged and deeply sort of enconced in the structures of the state uh, so now of course it's it's uh, it's something that is not a convenient uh, uh, you know uh, a constitutional uh, uh, remnant to hang on to and and therefore uh, this uh, this response i do want to say because we kind of got distracted from that earlier uh, Uh, film earlier youtube tip that you saw we didn't never talk talked about uh what's what's happening is with organizations such as roots in kashmir i think what the the narrative that they've been pandering is that what we see in kashmir is a clash of civilizations right it's islamic civilization uh that has uh, for some reason over the years uh you know inhilated the hindu civilization and kashmir rightfully belongs uh to hindus and is a hindu homeland so to speak or himalayas are being uh reframed as the last frontier of hindutva politics now i want to argue and have or argue this enough that this is precisely the logic right that shapes every intervention of the bjp since august 5th it is essentially to exterminate muslims of kashmir from kashmir it's not just a demographic exercise it's much beyond that it's a way more dangerous exercise and i think we have to come to terms with that and recognize it and name it for what it is 
Mm. If I can just we're add one more point over here. Program. We are at the end of the program. There are no more points to be added in this particular section. But it's interesting on YouTube, people are actually asking, why is the international community not doing more about what is happening in Kashmir? It's a story that we continue to go back to and we will continue to do so. Uh, Misa Sayeb, Mona, Safwa, thank you so much for being on the stream. Uh, it's a good point for me to actually say, come here, look at my laptop here. There is always more to discuss on the stream. So every day, Sunday through Wednesday at 16.30 GMT, we always have an Instagram live chat, takes us behind each episode. And you may even catch one of the guests from the main episode so we can talk to them a little bit more. Until the next time, thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.